Thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for trusting us with your children. Thank you for trusting us that we're teaching them age appropriate about Jesus Christ and what he can do in our life. And, and let me tell you, children's church and, and children's ministry is not daycare just to keep them until you get back. How many of you know they're learning about Jesus Christ? And it's so important for them to do that. And, and I think about our students on Wednesday night. It's so important for them to be together in fellowship and be a part of that. It's so important for you to be in a small group. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor. That's good. It's so important for you to be in a small group. It's so important for you to be a part, and we just want this to happen for you. This morning, I, I kind of kid it with the 9 o'clock on this. Uh, I don't want to preach this message this morning. I know that gives you lots of inspiration right there as we go. And Josh, can I have a little bit more on stage, please? But the, the reality of, of where we are and what we're doing right now, we always laugh about it. And, and uh, you know, if you've served with me any length of time, I'll say this in our growth track, that there's usually two things in church that everybody talks about. One is music. It's either too loud or too soft. They know what I'm saying. And ours is just perfect. I'm sorry. But, and then the second thing that people will talk about in church is something called money. And when you start talking about money in church, people get real nervous. How many of you know you don't have to be nervous? We're just going to show you what the Word of God says about it because of this simple premise here. 57% of people that are going through divorce named the number one reason they're going through divorce is financial problems. 57% of people, men that are surveyed, and I, I will throw in this, you need, our men need some people in their life to talk to. Because there's three things that men say are my biggest trials that I'm facing right now. The first one is money, which we're going to talk about today. The, sex, the second one is sexual purity and what that means to my life. And then the third one is, how am I going to lead my family in this culture? And so many times we ask that question of, we see things on our entertainment, we see things on social media, but I want my children to grow up with a relationship with Jesus Christ. How does that happen in America? How does that happen in the South? I read something this past week that has just kind of as a pastor, made me think over and over again. And what was said in the article, and it wasn't a pastor that was saying it, but he said it's, it's, it's okay to talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? You know, a lot of people will say they're Christians, but there's no fruit to back that up. And so realizing that I want to lead my family well, that I want to be sexually pure, and we need to be sexually pure because if we're not, that brings things into our life that we never want in our life. We understand that money is a big issue for all of us. All you've got to do is go to a Publix and get one meal for $100. And like you don't even like what you got, but that's all you could get that day. But, but the reality of that in the situation that Jesus over 2,000 times speaks on finances and money and stewardship. And he wants us not for it to be bondage in our life that holds us to this place that we have all these things happening in our life that are unhealthy, but Jesus gives us a formula to be free with finances and to have proper finances. 57% of people that get divorced will tell you the number one reason was money and money issues. And so if we take this and know this, this can change our life. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And notice this last verse. You cannot serve God and mammon. The, the people that he were talk, was talking to knew what he was saying. 
Now think about this. If somebody came into your life and said these words to you right now, you can't serve God, Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior, and you can't serve the devil. Because this word mammon meant, it was an Assyrian god named Mammon that was the god of wealth, riches, was the god of greed, that just, I need everything for myself. I'm going to bring everything in in my life. And so understanding what Jesus was saying, he made a very stark contrast in their life that if you cannot get this area of your life under control, and we as a nation are trillions of dollars in debts. We are, we are billions of dollars in credit card debt. Personally, talked to somebody just a few weeks ago that they have maxed out everything that they had to the hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit card debt right now. And they're just struggling over and over again and saying, I don't know if there's any hope for me. I don't know if there's any hope for my family. I don't understand how this is going to happen. And trying to encourage them that, hey, this may be an area of your life that you've just failed miserably in, but let me give you hope today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that I can get this area right in my life. You know, if you're raising children right now, how many of you know the bad habits that they had at 2, 3, and 4 will follow them to 12, 13, and 14 if you don't break that habit right now? You just think they're disrespectful now. Just wait till they're taller than you are. You think these things. And so understanding that this is a habit, this is a discipline, this is a practice in my life, that if I can get this right according to the Word of God, that I don't have to live in bondage any longer, I can live in freedom in this part of my life. The first thing I want to tell you is, first things first. First things first. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. How many of you are thankful that somebody went ahead of you to build buildings, to make it possible? Now, I, you know, some of you are outside people, but how many of you know your pastor's glad that gnats are not flying around me right now? <laughs> we were outside, that's what would happen. And they may happen on the inside. We get everybody saved around here in Jesus' name. They, they come in and want salvation, but I, you know, I want them to get saved in eternity right, right over there. But the reality of it is somebody paid the price for you to be here today. Every good and every perfect gift that you have comes from the Father above. But because of somebody's generosity, there's a building here, there's carpet here, there's chairs here because of somebody's generosity. Now notice this. It said that there may be food in my house, and try me in this. I've heard pastors say these words. Well, if you tithe and give, and if it doesn't work out, in a year I'll give you from now. But let me tell you something. Don't worry about that. Your pastor's not going to do that. I'm not going to say those words to you. If you don't believe God, you're not going to believe me. You can believe God. You can believe God for your salvation. You can believe God that he'll set you apart and bring you out of addictions in a couple of weeks. I'm going to talk about the freedom that you can have from addictions in Jesus' name. I'm going to talk about those things. But let me tell you something right now, that God, you can trust God with your finances. It's all his anyways. It's not that I give God something. I'm just a steward of everything that God gives me. Now notice this. He says, if I will not open up the wisdoms of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, I love that he'll open up the wisdoms of heaven, but I love this part even more. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So you can have every alarm company possible. You can sit out there and guard your property, your house, your family until you cannot stand up anymore. But when I have a covenant with God in tithing and giving, he stands at the door of my house and rebukes the devourer for my sake. 
That is a powerful statement that he told with Job in the, in the trial and the temptation that Job went through. Satan had to ask permission from God to touch his life anymore because he said, you can take his possessions, but you cannot take his life because I have a plan because God, Job is a righteous man that loves me and I will restore the things that you have stolen for him, but he will not bow his knee to you because he's in covenant with me. That is a powerful statement. I, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're in shape. But there's always somebody that's bigger and badder than you are, right? There, there's somebody that can take you down. There's somebody, but let me tell you, when you have the promise of God in your life that you are tithing, that you are giving, that you are believing God, God stands at the doorway and says, that's as far as you can go because I have a plan, I have a purpose for your life, and that's as far as it will take. Now notice this. It says, so that the destroyer, the fruit of the ground, nor shall the vine fall to bear fruit in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be held in delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now notice this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns may be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, above this scripture, it says do first things first. Church, if you're going to have financial peace in your life, you have got to do tithe and giving first. If not, what, he, what you have told the Lord is, Lord, I got this handled. I can do it all myself. We've already talked about it. It never seems like there's enough when I try to do it all by myself. There's not enough, but there's more than enough. And let me share this with some of you. And I didn't know if I was going to share this or not. And I've, I've been just, even back in the green room just a few minutes ago, I was like, I don't even know if I should share this because I, Shannon and I went through the 2008 housing crisis. And uh, after seven years, after paying two mortgages, we finally got somebody to take our house from us. Now, we had to give them $70,000 to do it. So I know what it is for it not to make sense on paper. I know what it is. We didn't go through bankruptcy. We didn't do any of those kind of things. We just made up in our mind, and I know some people that's had to go through it because of situations. But Shannon and I decided... Lord, if you'll help us to make it out on the other side, then we will stay faithful in this area of our life and we'll do what we need to do. We did that and God has blessed us. And I, let, me, let me give you a testimony today. We paid our tithes. We gave an offering. We were faithful. And I need to tell you, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. God helped us. Now, we have a joke that came out of that. And it's only funny after the fact. Can I get an amen? But Shanna said, if I would have known we could have paid two mortgages, we would have had a vacation house somewhere. Because paying two mortgages is not fun. But I can't came here to tell you today that if God can do it for us, he can also do it for you. I need to tell somebody else today, you think your situation is hopeless but the one that makes a way where there is no way will walk into it if you'll be in covenant with him. We live in a world full of contracts, but God wants to enter into covenant with you, but you got to do first things first. Now notice this, Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of the mint and the cumin and have neglected the way to your matters of the law justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now, I've had people, my whole ministry, come up to me and say these words to me. Pastor, all those verses you just read were Old Testament. We are New Testament believers. Those are the same people that are telling those stories about David. And you can kill your giant today. You just got to go to the battlefield by faith. You just got to do those things. 
They will talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They will quote the promises of God. They'll remember every prophecy from Ezekiel and Daniel. And they'll talk about that. That is yes and amen. And every word of God is yes and amen. And I believe it all besides Malachi chapter 3. And see, church, we can't pick the verses we like. God puts it in his word to give us life. And if we'll take it and do first things first, God has a plan. The second thing I want to tell you, and I've said it, you got to have a plan. you got to have a plan. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, least after he's laid the foundation and not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, The man has begun to build and was not able to finish. Or what a king going to make war against another does not sit down first and consider whether he is able and ten th- with 10,000 to meet him who comes out against him with 20,000. Now, you need to understand this is you need a plan. Now, I'm, I'm going to hurt some of your feelings. We're about to start a small group with Dave Ramsey. But how many of you know it's not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and Dave Ramsey? Now, he's got great principles, and most of his principles come from the Word of God. But you've got to figure out for your family what your plan is going to be according to the Word of God. I, I hear people say, well, you can't, you can't have a household with two uh, checkbooks. If Shannon and I were going to stay married, we needed two checkbooks at times in our life. She was, she was working away. I didn't want to use the debit card. We started doing it this way, and we had this. You need to pray, seek God, know God, figure out the plan that God has for your life, and say, God, I want to do it in such a way that would be pleasing to you. It doesn't mean that you have money that you've hid from them or you're taking advantage of them in any way. But what you're doing is saying this one thing, we're going to have a plan, we're going to work the plan, we're going to do it according to the Word of God, and God will bless that, and it will not put you in bondage. So. Let me ask you this question. What's your plan? I'm just going to work this week and get paid. It's not a plan. The plan's got to be this. Okay, God, you get first and you get best. And God, after that's done, and I've prayed about it and I've sought your face of how much, not just tithe because the tithe is set, how much offerings I'm going to give, how I'm going to support this ministry, what I'm going to do here, and then you've got to say these words. God, I need you to lead me and guide me. And and let me make this offer to us, and I see some of our trustees around here. These are great businessmen. We have other great businessmen and women in this house. If you come up and tell me, I don't know how to do this, we're going to put you with somebody that's going to help you. We, we've got people that are smart, that have had generational businesses, know what to do, know what to understand. You say, Pastor, well, I would be embarrassed to do that. Wouldn't it be better for you get a, to get a plan from somebody than having to go to a counselor for your marriage breaking up? Wouldn't it be better that if you went to somebody and said, hey, we're failing in this area, we don't know what to do in this area, help us in this area, and we're going to make these things happen. So you got to have a plan. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 27. Verse 23 says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats of the price of your field. And you shall have enough goat's milk for your food and for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maidservants. Let me just break this down for somebody today. You got to know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, you don't know what's going on, and you'll always find yourself in bondage. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know if this happens in your house. How many of you know that mother knows more than you do? All the dads say amen. Like, they know more. Like, I'll say, did you know? And she goes, oh, yeah, we decided that two weeks ago in Jesus' name. 
I'm going, thanks for telling me. It's not that bad, but they come to her first. There's nothing wrong with that because they want to see what daddy's going to think about it. So, you know, daddy gets small lip. When I'm displeased with something, they know immediately. She sits over there and smiles at him while she's displeased with him. I don't know how she does it. I have no poker face. I, I, you know what I'm thinking? When they say it, I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I don't always say that, but they, my face shows it. So they go to her first, but we're not at odds with each other. We have a plan. She doesn't hide things from me. We have a plan. Now, she's not going to tell me on Sunday morning before I preach because the message may be on heaven, but it may turn into something else. You've got to know each other well enough that you've got a plan. She has strengths in the areas that I'm weak in. So that's why we have a plan together, and we're working those plans. We're working those processes in our life. If you don't understand that, and you're a married couple, that you have strengths, they have weaknesses, they have strengths, and you have weaknesses, you will always be at odds with each other and be double-minded and unstable in all your ways. There needs to be some things in your life that says, as for me and my house, and I said it in the nine, and it's been on my heart so much in my life right now, but if I ever get up in the morning and say these words, hey, kids, y'all want to go to church or not? My kids have never heard that a day in their life. You say, because you're the pastor. No, 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 no. Because they're going to be adults one day. And Scripture tells me to train them up in the way that they should go. Now, are they going to be teenagers someday? <sighs> All falling apart, look like a wash rag. <laughs> I love them too much. I love them too much. I love them too much. There's a lot of times we ask, why did they turn out? like they did, and the, and the question a lot of time is, we were double-minded and unstable. We wouldn't miss travel ball weekend. The church becomes something optional. We wouldn't miss homecoming and spend thousands of dollars to get them there. I didn't know about this girl stuff. I had two boys to begin with. Spend money, spend time, and I do it all over again. But I, but I will tell you that if we're not on the same page, then our home is divided. And when your home is divided, the enemy will step in where you're not. And so you've got to be in that place in your life that you say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And it will not hurt them for you to say no, and we don't understand. I, I, I remember different times, and I've heard people talk about this. We, we all want vacation. Can I get an amen? Anybody want a good Christmas? I'll tell you what size shirts to wear, pants, the whole nine yards. We all want good things. But have you ever been with somebody, and every time they go out to eat, oh, look at the prices on this menu. Everybody's got to get water and carry the lemon home with us. We'll use it again. Wouldn't it be better to spend vacation three days at peace instead of seven days in misery? Wouldn't it be easier just sit there in peace eating some chicken and not complain over the steak? Wouldn't it be easier to just say, God, I need you to speak to me about being godliness with contentment is a great gain. God, I need you to speak to me in such a way that, see, Paul teaches this in Philippians chapter 4. He just tells us, see, everybody loves to quote this verse out of context, and if you've done it, I've done it too. So we're going we're gonna to have confession here today. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But then he goes on to say this. 
He said, whatever situation that I'm in, I can be content. You, you wonder why we have such anxiety, such stress, because we can't be content with everything. If we get a new car, we'll leave the lot and say, I wish I could have had this car. I, I wish we would have this house. I wish this thing would happen in our life. I wish, I wish, wish. Instead of saying, God, thank you for the car. Thank you that I don't have to walk. Thank you for the house that we're in. Thank you that we're not out on the street right now. Thank you that you've delivered me and saved me and helped me. And if we're not careful in life, we will look around. And Paul says it this way, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And he said, I can be content in any situation, whether you're taking care of my needs or whether I'm having to make tents. I can be content whether I'm abased, whether I'm abound, I can be content. Mom, Dad, I don't want my kids to have such anxiety that when something happens in their life, they're just falling apart. I don't want it to happen. And see, if I don't put that basis in our home of a foundation and say, okay, this is the foundation that we've set. This is what we're doing. We're not going to be, there, there's times that it's going to be spaghetti night. Can I get an amen? Anybody had spaghetti night without the meat sauce? We're going to do it Italian tonight, okay? Just some butter. Anybody ever had to add water to tomato soup? Those nights. Those nights that you have. But let me tell you something. Godliness with contentment is great gain. See, we've been sold something in our society today. And I, I, I think about this. There's a picture that I believe the Lord just helped me to find this week that has made it so clear to me right now of what we're facing in our society today. And it was a picture, it was a sketch of a man sitting there. And, but with both hands, he has these bag full of, of money in his hands, and he's just holding on to it so tight. And it's even like he's sitting in such a way like his knees are holding it because he's just there and he's holding on to it. It's, it's taking in everything is mammon of riches, of wealth, and it's going to make me happy. But you know, if you're holding on to that stuff so tight, if you're not willing to let go of some of it and give it to God, you'll never be able to reach out and hold your wife's hand. You'll never be able to reach out and hug your own children. See, God doesn't matter. God, you should perfect your craft, perfect your gifts. You know, those promotions, God has given you those promotions so that you can have greater influence. There's nothing wrong. God blessed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God did the work. But he didn't want us to hang on to it so tight because this world's wealth is going to pass away one day. And it's going to, you know, you, you think about it. And you remember as a kid, like you got $20, you're going to Kmart and buying two toys. Now you give your kids $100, cost 60 at Chick fil A, 20 more in gas, and 20 more on social media apps. And you're like, where did that go? It passed away. But see, the things that I do for the kingdom is going to last forever. See, somebody provided bread for you. And when you say, God, use these hands. Hang, hang loosely to the things of this world. Hang loosely to those things that you think are so important. Because let me tell you, some of the things that you wanted last year, anybody go, I didn't know this. You know, I did not know the thing of you had fall clothes that you put up and spring clothes that you brought out, all that kind of stuff. Anybody had to go up in the attic the past couple of weeks? It's not hot enough. I mean, it's not cold enough for it yet, but you still have to go up there because you're tired of your summer clothes. I didn't know about that until I got married. And there was a box for summer clothes, a box for spring clothes, a box for this, a box for that. And I'm like, 
So I did something this past week. I went to go look for those clothes. And I got real religious last season. I said, we're getting rid of all this. Not her stuff, my stuff. I've been married 32 years for a reason. But I went to go look for it, and I couldn't find it. I'm like, that was dumb. Now I've got to get new clothes. Some of you are going back to places and look for things that has already passed away. And you thought you held on tight enough that it would stay forever. But everything of this world will pass away. What I do for the kingdom of God, what I do for God in my life, that God, that somebody else can be blessed, that's what's going to last forever. We come to the place today that you got to do first things first. You need to have a plan. You need to be generous. But then we come to this place, and let me show you the last verse here. I want you to see this this morning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says, But this I say, who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of us, as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So let me make you a promise. It's simple. You'll never have enough in yourself. You'll never have enough in yourself. You'll never be enough in yourself. You can never do enough in yourself. But when you decide to be a giver with time, with resources, with giving, with whatever you have in life, if you do it according to God's plan, God will reward you with things that you'll never be able to get with money. He'll put peace in your home. He'll put joy back in your vacations. So you've been doing vacations for them, but what if you turned around and did it for your family again? What if you decided, I may not have the newest couch, the newest furniture, I may just have a 60-inch TV, somebody else has got the, I don't know, whatever the biggest one is now. But see, you can have the world but if you lose your family and lose your relationship in the process, you will look at me one day, like many people have, and say these words, if I had to do it over again, I would have done first things first. If I had to do it over again, I'd have a plan. If I had to do it over again, I would have been generous. And today, you say, Pastor, I don't know how to do this. We'll help you. We'll help you. And we'll do everything in our power to make sure that you do it God's way, which is the best way, which is the way that will lead to life. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes right there where you are. I don't want you to respond to pastor. But I'm going to ask you to be brave right now and have a conversation with God. I'm going to ask you to say, God, you can have my life, you can have my family, you can have my children. God, I dedicate all that to you. But if there's any area of your life that I think we struggle with so much, Will you be brave enough to say, God, you can have my finances. God, you can have my house. God, you can have my land. God, you can have my generosity. God, you can have every part of my life. 
that lordship of Jesus Christ because some of you, and I can see it on your face every Sunday, you're trying to carry that all by yourself. And you're trying to do it your way instead of God's way. And you find yourself deeper and deeper in bondage. And now you want to find yourself in freedom. And God has a way. So I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to ask you to pray right there where you are. And just to say these words, God, you can have it all. You can have my finances. You can have my generosity. You can, have, you can help me with the plan, and I'll do it according to your will. God, I need you to help me right now because I need you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name that's above every name right now for people that are making a lordship issue right now. God, with the area of their finances, with the area of their calling, with the area of their generosity, with the area of their tithing, God, that you can have it all, that you can do what only you can do right now, that you can help them learn how to have a plan, learn how to budget, learn how to walk these things out in their life. And Lord, right now, by your grace, your mercy, and your love, God, let it be done in Jesus' name. God, I just pray, Lord Jesus, God, I feel so deep in my heart right now. As Shannon and I have already talked about today, God, I pray that you restore hope to some people's lives right now. God, that you will restore their hope right now. God, they walked in here today and said, this is my last time. This is my last stop. This is my last moment. But God, when they leave here today, they'll say it's good to be in the house of God. I felt his presence. I felt his power. I felt his grace in my life. And no matter what I'm going through right now, my hope is in Jesus Christ. I want you to stay with your head bowed and your eyes closed just for another moment. You may be here today and say, Pastor, I want to get out of bondage with my finances. But I've been fighting some things in my life spiritually right now. And I've allowed some things to go back. And I'm like the prodigal son. And I've went back to the pig pen where I shouldn't have been. But I'm ready to get out. You may be here today and say, Pastor, I've done church, but I never gave my life to Jesus Christ. But today I want it to be my day that I give my life to Jesus Christ and my life changed forever. So I'm going to ask you, everybody in the room, to pray with me. But if you're here today and say, Pastor, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life, I want you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Let your blood wash away all of my sins. I will serve you as my Savior and my Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want you to stay with your head bowed and your eyes closed right now. Online, if you did that, put that in the comments. We want to help you with your next step. But if you're in the sanctuary today and said, Pastor, I have decided to give my whole life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, just raise your hand right there where you are. Just raise your hand right there where you are. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You can lower those hands. And I want us to give the Lord the loudest ovation of praise and worship. <laughs> praise God. 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 The main reason we meet on Sunday is so that one more person can come home. So one more person can say, I know my eternity has been settled because I prayed that prayer. I believed in my heart that Jesus Christ was Lord and I can't be saved. Let me share this story with you just real quickly and they're going to sing and we're going to be out on time in Jesus' name. But I just got to share this with some, some people ask me, why do we pray that prayer every Sunday? Because our church knows this just a few years ago. It came a stark reality in our life. And I know some people remember this moment that happened. Somebody came in and said about the second row over there. They said these words. And, you know, they gave their heart to Jesus Christ. We prayed with them. God did a wonderful work. Didn't know that Tuesday, and it was a young lady, didn't know that Tuesday that she would pass away. I did the funeral that week. 
And I promised myself after that moment I would never leave this service without giving you an opportunity to receive Christ. Now, I'm not saying anything bad's going to happen, anything like that, but I do know this. It may be somebody's first time here, but it may be somebody's last time here. And what I want to tell you today is if you live another 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, it doesn't matter how long you live, but one day you're going to stand before God and give an account of yourself before Him. And we want to know in this house that when you stand there, He says, welcome home. Welcome home. I prepared all this for you. Look who your neighbors are. You even like them. And that's what we want to happen every single Sunday.